Good morning and welcome to To The Point. Congressman Fred Upton has represented Southwest Michigan for more than two decades in Washington. He has seen a lot happen in that time period, but this past month there have been a number of things that have happened in the chamber that have certainly been remarkable. Included in that, a visit from a foreign head of state. That's where we start our conversation this morning with Congressman Fred Upton. It is always interesting to be a member of Congress. <laughs> particularly, I don't know where this question is going. <laughs> but particularly now, and it's not a laughing matter, but, but as an observer, as somebody who has watched this body for a very long time, this has been one of the most interesting periods of time that I can remember. Never ha do I remember a majority Congress having this kind of conflict with a president of from a different the start. Party. Uh, yeah, yeah. From, from day one. So we're not going to go back that far, but we're going to go back to a visit uh, by a foreign leader when Benjamin Netanyahu. Seems like a month ago. It does, it? <laughs> but but because so much has happened, uh, the news headlines. But that was that was big news. White House says just to set it up for folks who may not remember. White House says, wait a minute, that's a breach of protocol. Uh, Congress says, wait, we are an equal uh, entity in government. We can invite whomever we choose. That isn't the argument. The argument is what happened within that chamber because there was a dynamic. Let me tell you what one of your colleagues said. I got him on the phone shortly after I talked to you on the phone. I said, look, for all of the angst, this, uh, this speech seemed to be very well received within that chamber. And they said, well, Republicans bothered to spread out across the entire chamber to make sure that Democrats weren't concentrated on this side and Republicans <laughs> here uh, to, to make it look better. What was your take of what happened well, with right. the prime so minister? It, so this is, so, but remember, we can't just sit, re, Republicans, we can't just sit on the, the right side of the chamber anymore because we're more than half. So right. we've got, you got to have some people on the other side of the aisle uh, that fit there. The Senate's in front. Um, what my reaction was, and I, I did notice the Republicans were over there, uh, but pretty much the whole Congress was up and down together. So unlike maybe a State of the Union that's a little bit of a teeter-totter from time to time, although there's always some lines that get everybody up, the president of either party uh, likes to do that and, 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 you know, whatever. But it was, I, my re re reaction was not only was the gallery very enthusiastic and remember we only get one seat there so it's you know it's pretty bipartisan too and there's it's not by party the you know republicans don't sit here or whatever it's by seniority so it's all over the place but the mood itself within the chamber was i've never i don't think i've ever ever seen that maybe Maybe after the Gulf War when uh, President came in and, and he talked about the things that were happening and we applauded Petraeus and, you know, some of the others uh, that were there. Um, but it was, I thought it was a message that was well received by Republicans and Democrats. And you'll remember how it started was that Netanyahu praised uh, Barack Obama. And he thanked Harry Reid, who was sitting in the very first row. And, uh, and, and you know, I, I saw the exchange between the two of them as he came in and went out, and he really did give him a, a meaningful embrace. And uh, Reid, as you know, has had a, suffered a little bit of an injury right. when he fell and, and hit a table. So he's actually blind in one eye uh, right now. But uh, the, the reaction was, was a very positive one and one that was to the mark. That, and, you know, and as we see these skirmishes continue now this week, Tom Cotton, Republican senator, former House member from Arkansas, has released a letter that he was able to get dozens of senators uh, to sign. I've not seen the list. I don't know if any Democrats are there or not, but it reminds Iran that, in fact, what the president is doing, if he doesn't seek approval with a treaty, and again, this goes back to your opening, you know, are we an equal branch of government or not? The Constitution says we are. If it's a treaty, then you have to get the consent of the Senate to go along with it, and that, of course, makes it long-lasting. If the president only does this, whatever it is, because no one's seen any of the details of it yet, if he does it only by executive order or a handshake, it's not worth anything when he leaves office 22 months from now. I want to take that in three separate parts. First, let's talk about the substance of what the Prime Minister talked about, because it is his point of view, if I heard this correctly, that if Iran is allowed to continue with their nuclear program, and he believes that inexorably leads to nuclear weapons, 
then that means that the Middle East will become a nuclear power, that Saudi Arabia and others will say, if they have nuclear capability, we're going to have capability. Do you agree with that premise? I do. I do. I think that is a conclusion that most Americans uh, and most of my colleagues uh, would agree to, that if, if Iran gets the bomb, whether it's two years, ten years, or never, but if it's, you know, two or that the other nations, not only the Saudis, but the others, I think Jordan, I think Israel, they've suspected that they've had it for some time, but I, mean, I, I think that you definitely see the Saudis and other, Turkey perhaps, others, uh, all within that region want the same. The, the second part of that is the equal parts of government. There was a senator with whom you are familiar with from Michigan who talked uh, very seriously about these foreign policy debates and squabbles ending at the water's edge. And you have seen the headlines over the past week uh, referring to that water's edge mentality. Now, to be fair, that was never a policy, but that supposition has been broken a number of times. The idea was that we can fight amongst ourselves, but once we move offshore, we do it with the United Front. That's not happening now. The letter from those senators suggests it's not happening well, now. Is you, that is but, that a, but a you bad have idea? to remember though that if you try so what this president has tried to do on a number of fronts is through the executive order, immigration reform. You know, ho even the Democrats you remember, and we've talked about this in earlier times, urged him not to embark on that path, knowing that it ought to be done legislatively, not by executive order. And what's happening now uh, on this is that, um, you, uh, again, you, you take this back to the early 90s with the first Gulf War. Bush, 41, did not want to take it to the Congress. He wanted to do this on his own, skirting the War Powers Act, whatever was there. And I was among those that went to see him and said, you know what, this is a pretty important vote. And you need, and the, the country is watching what's going on. You really have to get a vote of the Congress to try and get this thing done. And the argument is being made now with, with Iran that if you try to do this by executive order, it's really, it's not in abeyance come January 21st, uh, 20, 2017. It's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's, there's nothing to, to to gird it up. So you ought to be transparent about what the deal is. And if it really is going to be a treaty, we're going to do this. I mean, the sanctions, whatever, it, it ought to be legislatively. And, and you ought to be proud of the, frankly, you ought to be proud of whatever that, that deal is to know that you can get a, a, a majority of the Senate to approve it. What's wrong with that? I mean, that's, that's the test. I mean, are you doing something with the American people's uh, endorsement or not? And if you're trying to hide behind not going with the Senate, um, that's, that shows weakness. Final question on this subject, and, and that is this. If you don't have conversations with, and if you can't come to some kind of an agreement with Iran, then what is the next step? Because they have proven their willingness uh, to go against international sanctions. They have proven their willingness not to let inspectors in. So if you don't have an agreement, and, I, and let me quickly point out that an agreement doesn't mean they'll do any of those things anyway, but if you don't have an agreement, then what? Well, part of the argument here is that what we have done on sanctions, and we've had votes on those. Those have been mandated, uh, agreed to by the president, signed off by the Congress with a real up and down vote that we're, you know, we're accountable for. It's my belief that those tough sanctions on Iran, coupled with what other nations have done, have been what has brought Iran to the table. Now, the key at this point is you don't lift those sanctions without coming through with, 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 the, with the deal, to use a bad word, of saying, no, you're not going to develop a nuclear weapon. And you're going to keep those sanctions in place to make sure that that doesn't happen. By, by letting the sanctions uh, blow the steam out, uh, by, by allowing the, the uh, deal to proceed, lifting the sanctions and still allowing Iran to, to operate thousands of centrifuges, being able to be on target for building a nuclear bomb, it's the, the previous you know, number of years with the sanctions is all for naught. Uh, that's what brought them to the table, but then to do a bad deal to let them build the bomb, I mean, it's 
It's craziness. Going to go back on my word. I said that was the last question. Yeah. I'll make this right. the last question. If a deal is made that Israel sees as a bad deal, one that threatens the security of their nation, and they're very, very sensitive about that. I mean, th these uh, threats from Iran are something that they take right to the heart. If Israel wanted to unilaterally act against Iran, would the United States government get in their way? You know, I don't know the answer to that. That's subject to a lot of discussion about Israel, the self, you know, self-protecting. There was a story, I don't know if you saw it, it was in, on Drudge. So I'm actually one that looks at Drudge Report almost every day. Sometimes they take news, it's not, it never makes the mainstream. Sometimes they, they you know, they're out way in front of the mainstream as well. There was actually a report about a week ago that said that the President Obama uh, was informed, I think it was John Kerry, I'm paraphrasing now, uh, was informed that Israel might launch jets uh, against some of these nuclear sites in Iran. And the Drudge Report indicated that the U.S. government, through Kerry, obviously with a sign off with President Obama, said if you send those planes, we're shooting your planes down. I don't know if that's true or not. Never made it into the New York Times or the Washington, you know, some of the mainstream media. But I don't know what the, what the answer would be. But Israel feels, you know, as they try to save themselves, they're, and we saw this with Netanyahu last week, very committed to say, if don't get a bad deal because we can't survive if you do. We go from security I and didn't answer your question because I don't know the answer. Well, but I think that's fair enough because I, I think that decision is not likely to be made at the congressional level. I mean, if something like that happened. And there's much more to talk about with Congressman Upton, including what's next for the Affordable Care Act. Republicans have voted dozens of times to try to get rid of what they call Obamacare. But the fact is they know the president would never sign the bill. In fact, Congressman Upton tells us just that later in this program, but he also tells us why he does think there could be an off-ramp for the Affordable Care Act. That and more coming up next, To The Point. Welcome back to To The Point. Well, being in Congress, as we pointed out in the first half of this show, is always interesting. And one of the other interesting facets of what's going on in Washington right now is the continuing battle over amnesty, as some call it, or the right to work for some people who are not U.S. citizens. Either way, it's an executive order from the president that Republicans don't like, and that's led to a showdown on funding for an important government agency. We talked with Congressman Upton about that. Let's move from Mideast security, safety, and lack thereof to homeland security. And an issue that you dealt with in the Congress over the past few weeks probably had more, again, to do with politics and executive orders than it did to do with homeland security. But at question was, would the Department of Homeland Security be funded, understanding that within that funding, there were executive orders that would allow people to get work visas here in this country who had not achieved citizenship. Uh, it went late into a Friday once and came back the next week and you told me, and, I, and I'm quoting you, if I misquote you, certainly correct me, but you said, uh, I'm not gonna let the government shut down when you voted in favor of this DHS. Was that more or less your theory? I was not gonna let the government shut down. We have, you look at the threats against us now uh, and I mean, it goes, the, the issue, this issue itself goes back to the immigration issue, which the president did this by executive order. I'm one that believes, yes, we need immigration reform, but we need to work, it needs to be le a legislative solution versus an executive order. So the president's wrong in doing this. A federal judge ruled uh, that the president's executive orders should not be able to stand. Uh, it's now been a couple weeks. They haven't been, you know, the, the appeal is not overturned. Uh, what this one federal judge uh, did down in Texas, uh, I'm not a lawyer, but my sense is that that order, the current order will stay for months to come um, because the argument, even the president said, uh, president himself said 22 times, he didn't have the authority to do what he ultimately did. But to shut, so we've won. In, in essence, those of us that want him, you know, these executive orders to not be in force, we've won that argument. And to deny our homeland security folks, so who are these folks? They're all of our border patrol folks. 
they're the Coast Guard that's interacting, interdicting uh, drugs and protecting the, the, what you normally hear on the Great Lakes, but of course it's shut down with, with the ice. It's the TSA folks to make sure that our planes are safe. I mean, it's all these different agencies and to tell them, now remember, some of them are deemed essential, so no, you're still gonna go to work. The vast majority of them are essential. Yeah, 85%. I mean, you're not going to just open the border up. I mean, let's face it. I mean, people, I mean, you're not going to do that. But you're not going to pay them. Well, well, what great morale that will be, right? I mean, lots of folks live paycheck to paycheck or not very far. I mean, they've got car payments and mortgage, uh, kids in school, all those different things. You can't. I mean, this just, how long would it last? I mean, it's just craziness. So knowing that in fact we've won on the court side, why are we gonna penalize the very folks who are out there to protect us from some act of terrorism or a bad deed or law enforcement issue that uh, we really care about? And that's, so I'm not gonna vote. No, I was not gonna vote to shut the government down. I, I think what happened with the judge was, was the right thing to do. Uh, I voted to have a little couple more weeks to see if we could negotiate something with the, with the Senate. That was rejected. Uh, even though I voted for it, at the end of the day, I voted uh, for, for an extra week. The Senate was pretty clear that they weren't going to do an extra week. They would have done three weeks. Um, and at the end, you know, you hear, here you have a straight, clean bill, no earmarks. Things get funded and you get it behind us uh, for this fiscal year. And, and I was a yes vote. But some of your Republican colleagues were not. And there have been some of the more conservative Republican groups out there that have been pretty critical of the 75 of you, I believe, who voted uh, in favor of this. How big uh, of a rift does this create within a caucus that has already been rumored to have some problems? Some, well, some I think most, most of my colleagues would say, even though they might have voted no, and a majority of Republicans did not, or a majority of Republicans voted, did vote no, but I think as I've talked to most, many of them, since we had that vote a week ago, I think most of them, most of the ones that I talked to said, they knew that that was the right vote. They knew it was going to pass. The easy vote, I guess you could say, was uh, a no vote. Um, and so they, they cast that vote. They wanted to be uh, you know, strong against the president. But again, we won. I mean, look at the, what the Wall Street Journal wrote the last week. You, we've won. The you know, federal judge has, has ruled against the president uh, to penalize these workers who are looking to protect the U.S. I mean, that's just wrong. And you know, the other thing that's interesting among polling just Republicans, only a third said, shut her down. The other two thirds said, what are you doing? You know, f for me, we're in the majority. To, f to me, this is my moment, all right? I worked for President Reagan, we finally, you know, we complained bitterly about the lack of uh, votes and things that the, the Senate was unable to do the last two years, keeping things bottled up on issues from Keystone to, to you name it. So now that we're in the majority, we're going to say shut the government down? I mean, that's not very responsible in my book. Is comprehensive immigration reform dead? No. <laughs> got to wait. <laughs> it's, got a, it's got a heartbeat. Um, I, it shouldn't, I shouldn't smile. Um, I believe very strongly in the immigration reform. Um, we got to deal with the 11 million people that are here uh, that are undocumented. 40% of them came legally. They overstayed their visas. We need border security, uh, but you know, I talked to my farmers, I talked to some last week, probably talked to some this week as, as well. They can't operate. We, can't, we would not have a wine industry. I had the head of St. Julian Wine uh, down in Pawpaw tell me three weeks ago, we would not have a wine industry if we did not have migrant workers uh, to work in the grape fields and be able to, to bring that product in. Uh, the economic impact, not only here in Michigan, but around the rest of the country. I mean, look at, look at what Governor Snyder is saying. We need 8,000 welders now. We want to get to a 4% growth rate in this country. We cannot do that without the construction jobs, whether it be highway or anything else, uh, that we need. And so immigration reform is not, you know, we've, we've not been able to move it. Senate, actually, that was one bill that they did move in the last Congress that the House did not move. But at the end of the day, I am hopeful, <coughs> somewhat encouraged, that in fact uh, we will, in the Congress, uh, deal with this issue before too long. Uh, and we have to deal with all of it, from border security to a migrant worker to farm visas to, you know, 
the whole number of things, including the 11 million people that are, that are not here. And I don't call it amnesty. To me, amnesty is a blank slate. Here you go. You're fine. You know, forgiven 100%. No, you're going to pay a fine. You're going to make sure your back taxes are paid. You're going to register so we know where you are. We're going to do a background check to make sure that there's not a felony or, or whatever. And if at the end of that, you know, a process for a number of years, you're going to learn English, probably. But you're going to have that. You're going to be able to have insurance. Don't you want the car coming your way? Don't you want the driver to have insurance? You're going to be able to have a bank account. Don't want to just hold it up in your house, in the sock drawer where most of us, you know, what we do. Uh, but we're going to have a process that then if they want to become U.S. citizens, they're going to go to the end of the line, and if that end of the line is still years from happening, knowing that you're going to, you know, you're going to have all these weights. To me, that is not amnesty, but dealing responsibly with the 11 million folks that are here, knowing full well that you know we're not having a program to send 11 million people back to wherever they came from. Some countries won't admit any of them back anyway. China, they won't take a soul. Let's shift gears for a minute to the Affordable Care Act, something that you and your colleagues have voted more times than I can, can count <laughs> uh, to repeal. There are two things going on. Right now there is a pending court decision that would suggest that getting the subsidies for the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare could be limited to only those states that have a federal exchange. Some say that was just a minor clerical error in the way the bill was written. Others say you got to interpret the bill as it was written. Some believe if that was ruled to be the case that Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act would collapse under its own weight because there would not be enough money coming in to make it work. That's not the issue. You have something called the uh, Obamacare off-ramp, if I've got that correct. Tell me what that is and, and how that would deal with the situation. Well, we're waiting for the court to rule. We know that the president, under any circumstance, is not going to sign a bill that repeals Obamacare. Uh, and if, if he would veto it, there's, we don't have two-thirds. Anybody can count. That, that doesn't happen. So what do you do? Well, before the court now uh, is a case that was heard last week uh, that precisely is focused on the language of the law itself that does say that if you're if you've got a state that is not uh, is not signed up with its own exchange that there cannot be any any subsidy what you re just referenced uh, that's about 34 states including Michigan that, that's in that category so if the court rules that in fact it's been illegal for subsidies to come to states uh, they would then have a, uh, there's a little bit of a time frame that would allow folks to continue their coverage, that it, uh, but at some point it will come to the end. There's a couple different things in place that's not worth getting into right now, but that is the chance then where we have to say, if the, if the court does rule that way, in essence against Obamacare, that we would have an off-ramp that would offer some protection, some, some assistance for people that would otherwise lose uh, their insurance. Uh, so we, we would allow for choice. We would allow, it's something that we're discussing now. We don't have a bill at this point. Uh, we outlined some principles in, in uh, the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal, both the Senate and the House, uh, to talk about some of those alternatives. And in the weeks ahead, we'll actually work on drafting a bill, legislation, that could be put into place to deal with this issue should the court uh, rule the way that uh, to, to in essence strike it down. As always, there is much more to talk about and not just what's happening in Washington, but right here in Michigan. I'll have a final thought about that when we come back to the point. Well, that's a view of what's going on in Washington, but in Lansing, there are a number of battles that are going on about the budget and about social issues. Next week, we'll start looking further into what's going on under the dome in the state capitol. I hope you'll join us next Sunday morning at 10 o'clock for To The Point.